Hello everybody. Today I would like to talk a bit about radio technology. Well, not really technology. It's, this is something that's been around since the, the first days of radio and well understood. Um, and it's something that affects your everyday life even though you don't realise it. Well, ev everyone's life if you use any kind of radio equipment such as ra radio broadcast radios or mobile phones. Have you ever wondered why antennas are different lengths? In this case this is a cheap little FM radio, solar powered. It's got this nice little short antenna. Better quality radios from more well-known brands, maybe Sony or Philips or Roberts Radio, um, would have longer telescopic antennas. I'll explain why. You've got mobile phones. Well, there's no external antennas on them nowadays, so how big, where's the antenna hidden? And it can't be very big, because that's, what, 5 centimetres by, what, 12 along here? So it must be a very small antenna hidden inside. And then you can go up to the top-end stuff. This is an old uh, British Army military antenna. They used a radio system called Klansman until about oh, 15 years ago. And uh, this is two and a half metres long when it's extended and put together. It's made by Siemens and it still has its NATO code on it as well. So you can actually look up and see when something was made. And this was made in 91. Well, the reason why it matters is because um, every antenna has a sweet spot, an ideal length which for a given frequency the most energy that is put into that antenna will be dissipated into the atmosphere. So therefore uh, if you put say 100 watts into an antenna that is the correct length for the frequency you're transmitting exactly 100 watts of that power will be dissipated into the atmosphere. And the reason why is because radio frequencies have wavelengths. It's a physical actual wavelength. You can't see it but in a laboratory situation you could. Uh, now, if I give you an example, um, I'll get some paper out to do this. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, just A frequency in general. So let's say you've got your center line, and your frequency, your radio frequency will go like that, and that's a radio wave, right? And that's your content is encoded into that. Now, the wavelength is one complete. Uh, wave. So from this case it would be from here to here. That's 360 degrees. And let's just say your, transmit, your frequency you're transmitting on is 7.1 megahertz. And you, to find the wavelength for that you do 300 which represents the speed of light which is actually 300,000 meters per second but we use 300 because we also use megahertz uh, so it's a shorthand trust me in this divided by 7.1 mh dead and that equals 42.25 meters so from here to here is 42.25 so moving on to the antenna side of things theory is that if you want to dissipate a, 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 a radio signal at 7.1 megahertz with a maximum efficiency, your antenna would need to be 42.25 meters long. Uh, what happens if it isn't is two things. If you're using an antenna that's too long, the signal does get dissipated, but the problem is the radiate, radiation pattern will be incorrect and the radiation pattern is just basically how the sort of direction the radio signals take off from an antenna and every antenna has um, a very specific radiation pattern and some go up at an angle, some go straight up, some go flat. Um, if you use a, an antenna that's too long, the pattern that's designed for that antenna might not work out as intended. So the signal will be dissipated, it just might not go in the direction you expect. Uh, if you use an antenna that's too short, then you have major, major problems. Because what effectively happens is, as you're pumping the signal in, it reaches the end, effectively the wavelength energy, the energy uh, wavelength reaches the end before it expects, and it bounces back. And two things, well, several things can result in this. First, the most obvious one is uh, it interferes with the signal. Effectively, as one signal is coming out, the previous signal, part of the signal is going back and it mixes together and distorts the signal. Second one is some of the energy will get back into the radio and actually can damage the radio because you're effectively building up energy on what we call the final stages of the radio, which is the 
amp amplifier stage and it can actually damage the radio which is a particular issue in amateur radio settings where the power is much higher and it would be a massive issue for say broadcast systems like television and FM radio uh, uh, and also another issue is it can actually cause interference with devices around you so for example uh, one of the common problems with ham radio uh, is that if you have these signals bouncing back <coughs> And you're not taking care to deal with them. Your neighbours' televisions and radios can get will pick up interference because you're generating bad energy effectively, and it's not being taken care of. And what we so what you want is ideally uh, an antenna that is the correct length. Now it doesn't actually have to be this. It can actually be half of this, quarter of this, or one third of this because such is the way of radio. And you can look this up yourself. But the um, as long as it's a, as long as you've got a length where the, the signal will eventually dissipate nicely, and if you can imagine like a if the antenna was like nine tenths, you go it's the the signal is not going to be able effectively you're chopping the signal up into segments and they're all going to get dissipated eventually because they will reach the end of the antenna. Uh, if it's say like nine tenths of the, the wavelength um, or not a, not an even uh, factor, the signal will bounce around because it doesn't fit, for want of a better word. Um, it's actually quite a hard thing to explain. So what, in this case here, this antenna, if you're broadcasting in 7.1 at 42.25, that would have a standing wave ratio of 1. And that's what we call this. It's a ratio. So uh, if, say for example, the antenna was... Uh, so uh, so for every, as soon, if the antenna gets shorter than it should be, then the standing wave ratio increase. So if it's a little bit out, it'll be 1.1. A bit more, it'll go up to 1.2. Uh, and generally, anything above 1.5 is considered particularly bad. Uh, you're getting into sort of territory of distorting the signals really bad. Because, um, like, of course, if you've got a fixed sized antenna, you, you you need to be able to sort of use it on adjoining frequencies, and that's okay so long as the standing wave ratio doesn't go too high. If you get into 1.5, you've got problems, and you should be dealing with them. Um, and another reason also for which I didn't cover is another byproduct of having a bad standing wave ratio is because your signal's not being dissipated correctly, you're not uh, getting rid of, um, you're not getting the full benefit of uh, the energy being dissipated properly into the environment. So you're not you're not transmitting the full power of your signal. So anyway, so let's take a look at some common uh, some simple sums here. So let's say if you've got seven, if you're transmitting on seven point one. You can use an antenna that's 42.25 meters, that's the ideal length, but of course you can use one that's half a quarter length. And in generally in amateur radio terms, this is an amateur radio frequency, where you would use what's known as a half wave dipole, which is half the length, which would be uh, 21.12.5 meters um, in length, and you split it in the middle where you join the wires, so you've got two legs roughly 11 meters, 10 and a half meters length in length. For a trans uh, FM radio, 100.1, which is the frequency for Radio Nova in Dublin, uh, the ideal length would be 2.9 meters, but uh, generally uh, you'd see the the telescopic antennas you would get would be go from anything from 10 centimeters up to a meter, so you can adjust to get the ideal frequency. Now, one of the things you'll notice is cheaper radios have these little short antennas, which this is like very, this is barely 30 centimeters, but better quality radios would have a much longer antenna, and that's simply uh, because they they were kind of hoping that in this day and age you'll be in a city where the signals are so powerful, you can get away with using a shorter antenna. No, it's not picking up the correct, and it's not picking up all the energy, but it'll be picking up enough to get a signal. Uh, the problem arises if you go out into the countryside, <coughs> or far out into the suburbs, where you know the signal starts to degrade and drop off, and you're going to have problems then. But for the most part, cheap. You no, know, everything's designed on most consumer equipment is designed on the assumption that signals will be pretty strong. And 2600 megahertz, which is one of the 4G frequencies for mobile phones. Uses antenna, uh, has an ideal antenna length of 11, uh, 0.11 meters, so 11 centimeters. Uh, but again, if they're using a half wave or a quarter wave antenna, you can easily see how that would fit into a phone like this. And of course, if you want to go down to the very bottom end of the, uh, the amateur radio band, 3.6 megahertz would use an antenna 83.3 meters long, or if you're using a half wave dipole, 40 meters thereabouts. Uh, hence, so this is one of the reasons why we uh, uh, we get the terms 80 meter band and 40 meter band. The 7.0 7 to 7.2 megahertz is known as the 40 meter band, which is roughly, because the frequencies are roughly come out at 42 thereabouts meters wavelength, 
we just shorten we just shorten it to 40 meters. And in the case of 3.5 to 3.8 megahertz, we call it the 80 meters band. So, how do you deal and protect yourself against bad standing wave ratios? We use a device known as an antenna tuner, which I'll show you in a short while. Uh, modern, there's various types of antenna tuner using various circuitry. Now, the most simple type is what's known as a T network because it looks like a T. So you have your radio here, and it comes into a capacitor, a variable capacitor. Now, a capacitor will uh, <clears throat> let frequencies above a certain above a certain frequency through. So you, you adjust it, and it'll let uh, a certain frequency through. Uh, I'm not going to give you the 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 mathematics for it now because it'll just complicate matters but it's on the internet if you want to look at it but just to say you tune this and uh free this up to say let everything above seven through and it goes through here and this is let designed to let seven through as well and that goes off to the antenna but as it comes back as this let's say you've got the antenna is too short so you get signals bouncing back well they'll let they'll let the frequency through but then it can't come through here because there's a signal coming through already so it gets diverted off into this section which is under this, which is a variable inductor. An inductor operates like a capacitor in reverse in terms of radio frequency. It'll let signals through that are below a certain frequency. So, and what happens is that the frequencies that the signals that go off to the antenna, which get distorted, generally get reduced in frequency a slight amount. So they come back and get diverted off here and driven to ground. That's Earth, for want of a better word. So effectively, that wasted energy comes back and gets pumped into the ground and wasted. Now, an antenna tuner does not make a, an antenna suddenly magically better than it was. If an antenna is designed for a certain frequency, that is the only frequency it will operate at and, and dissipate the most amount of energy. What this, though, what an antenna tuner does is effectively take the, the energy bouncing back and divert it off somewhere it won't do damage. So the reality is you might be pumping out 100 watts, but the antennas say designed for a low frequency and only 80% so 80 watts of that is getting dissipated the extra 20 watts will still come back in here but it'll get take, taking effectively removed they, we call it reactants that the reactive signals are coming back and being dissipated so they won't distort the signal and they won't damage the equipment and uh, this is an SWR meter that's built in and this tells you the ratios of what's coming through and if I yeah, so you can see there's the forward and reflected. So the forward signal is what you're pumping out, the reflected is what's coming back. And there's two needles, and where those needles meet, you get the ratio here. And ideally, you want them to meet. Oh. Somewhere along here. Which is so which is a a one-to-one -one ratio. But as you can see as you go up, it goes from 1.5 all, all the way up to 2. So so what it doesn't, it doesn't make, like I said, it doesn't make the antenna magically work better on a frequency it's not designed to work for. It merely eliminates the problem, the, 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 the sort of the symptoms of that. Uh, so, which is great because they, in amateur radio we talk about tuning up an antenna to work on a different frequency. What you're basically saying is you're making the most of a bad situation. You're not making the antenna better. You're just dealing with the problems that come about from using the incorrect antenna. So what I'm going to do is quickly open this up and show you this. But this is actually a passive device. I think it surprises a lot of people. There are fancier antenna tuners which do have moder more modern circuits. Um, and they're more expensive and you tend to find those you'd be used more in professional environments like broadcast or um, uh, business, business mobile radio and the like. But for us, <coughs> an amateur radio geeks, so we don't need that. So if we open it up, you'll see it's actually quite a, a simple device. Tip around here, you've got your two variable capacitors. One's called transmitter, one's called antenna. So the antenna one goes to the an, uh, goes out to the an, the an, is at the antenna end of the circuit, and the transmitter one is at the transmitter end. And there's our variable inductor, which is controlled using this big knob. Some cheaper ones are notched like this, but more expensive ones you'll actually have a handle that rolls along nice and smooth, and you can stop at any location. And if I show you here, you'll see all these bits soldered on here, and those are each individual notch of the variable inductor. What happens is, transmitter comes in here, goes through 
to there, that goes to there, and that goes out to the transmitter, to the antenna. Now, there is some, you'll go, well, there's some electrics there. Well, that's for the SWR meter. And the way the SWR meter works is it puts two coils around uh, the, the, the wire to the antenna, the coax, well, the lead, and in this case, and it just simply measure using a coil, it just simply measures the power levels coming and going. It's, each, each coil is designed to work in a different direction. And each needle is connected to one of the to each of these coils. So it's simply one coil measures the power going out, another power, coil measures the power coming in, and the needles adjust accordingly. I also notice these buttons, these are uh, oh, um this just various settings so like high low changes the scale so if you're working on low power you just change change that to low and that lowers the needle the level at which the needle will come up there is an electric input for the lamp but that's only a lamp for the swr meter which i never use and tuner and bypass tune and bps means tune you're using this as a tuner or bps means bypass which actually bypasses this circuitry completely but yet this is a passive device you do not need to plug it in you just plug into the antenna you just plug your antenna in here and here and away you go you don't actually need to power this up from anything. So there you go. It's a. So this is actually fairly primitive technology, and it's still in use. Um, why this matters to you, then? Well, if any any piece of equipment that's made nowadays with radio equipment has is now they have to take into account standing wave ratio to get the antenna length correct. And with modern mobile phones using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NFC, they're trying to sort of uh, use single antennas instead of multiple antennas, and using chip-based uh, antenna tuners too. Make it work with one antenna and reduce the cost. But there you go. That's what a standing wave ratio is and an antenna tuner is. Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers. Bye-bye.